Hi everyone, welcome to OMC. Um, today I'm going to jump right in to the passage. Well, actually we're going to review first from a little bit of what Dorman talked about last week, because we're in Mark chapter 10, if you'll remember, and at the beginning of Mark chapter 10 is the discussion about marriage and divorce. And so what we learned about last week is that, um, well, the Pharisees came to Jesus and they asked him what he thinks about divorce because it was a controversial issue at the time. And he brings them back to, he brings them back and asks them to remember the value that God places on people from the beginning of creation instead of um, answering based on their idea of their, uh, instead of answering based on their social systems and structures of the day because they had two sides and they wanted him to pick a side but he um, pointed them to the bigger picture and the bigger picture that God, yeah, the val and asked them to look at the value that God places on people from the beginning of creation instead of the value that their social systems placed on each other. And so this whole conversation happens and then the disciples go back with Jesus back to the house and start asking him questions privately about divorce. And this is where we're picking up in Mark chapter 10 today, um, verse 13. The disciples are probably still here. Um, they still have questions. They're not done with their discussion about divorce with Jesus. They maybe just got back. And then the, these people, or a lot of people, come and bring children, start bringing children to Jesus and want them to bless them. Um, and so, yeah. So we'll see what the disciples' reactions to the children. I'm going to start reading in Mark chapter 10, verse 13, if you want to follow along. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. They did not want to be interrupted because they were not done talking to Jesus. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Sometimes interruptions to interrogations are indications of God's initiations. What I mean by that is essentially sometimes interruptions that come when we're um, attempting to maybe seek answers from God or um, do, do other things are actually the answers we've been looking for, but we're too busy or we, we don't think we have time to see them. Right? The disciples said, Jesus doesn't have time for the children. He has more important things to do, like answer our questions. And I mean, honestly, Jesus was probably, Jesus of all people, probably was really busy. Like he probably had a really good excuse or reason to not have time to just bless the children, like not have time to, yeah, to bless the children. Um, but Jesus's message about the kingdom of God being here now was different from the disciples' idea who thought it was something that they had to get to, and they were still trying to get there, and they wanted to get their, their answers figured out, and they thought that Jesus had other uh, priorities. The kingdom of yeah, the kingdom of God was not a place to get to. It's the it was a gift that was already had already arrived. Jesus kept saying the kingdom of God is here, now. And so, if the kingdom is here now, um, Jesus has time for the people in front of him. He has time. He just he has time. He has time for the children. How often do we tell um, somebody, I'm too busy, or I don't have time, or, um, yeah, I, I think I'm guilty of this a lot, and I know it's easy to, in our culture, because busyness is seen as a really good thing. Um, but, 
just leave it there, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, in the ancient world, children held the lowest status and position in society. So they would have been equivalent to slaves. As Andrew mentioned this in his sermon, the word for children can also be used for slave. So in the social hierarchy, children are at the bottom. They have no rights and no privileges. Um, they own nothing. Their time is not their own. Their money is not their own. Um, they are at the bottom. And an example that I think Dorman mentioned, but in ancient Greece and Rome, it was an accepted social practice to abandon unwanted children along the roadsides to die. Like that's how children were viewed. Um, and so for the disciples to push away the children, um, it wouldn't have been seen as, it wasn't an uncommon practice. It would have just been seen as like a social norm thing for them to think that their time with Jesus was more important than the children's time and Jesus would have time for the children. Um, and so it was, they were more concerned about, or they were more focused on their, what they wanted, the, their position of privilege, that they didn't have time for the unimportant um, lowest members of society, the children. Um, and positions of privilege make poverty possible. When it becomes a social norm to treat certain members of society a certain way, and when everyone does it, and it's been done for years and years and years, it just becomes okay. So, for the, yeah, again, for the disciples to push away the children, it would have made sense to them and to most people. But not to Jesus. Jesus gets mad. And this is pretty big, because this is only the third time in Mark. Mark doesn't refer to Jesus' emotions. He doesn't, he's not an emotional writer. This is only the third time he refers to Jesus' emotions in the whole book of Mark so far. And Jesus gets mad, and he it, it's a strong emotion of indignation followed by a rebuke. And not only does Jesus stop the disciples and speak up for the children, he also <clears throat> says something kind of crazy. He says the kingdom of God belongs to those like, like these children. Because <sighs> we've been talking about the kingdom of God in Mark, but up till now, he's never said it about it belonging to anyone. And he chooses children of all people to liken the kingdom of God to who it belongs to. The bottom of the social um, hierarchy, the ones with no rights, equivalent to a slave. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> when Jesus says that we should receive the kingdom like a child, it's not the idea that we need to have more innocence or more childlike faith or something like that, um, but that it should be received in the way a child would have received it. Um, that a child would receive the kingdom as to something to which he or she was not entitled. It's not a matter of right or privilege. Um, children don't get to make decisions. Their parents make decisions for them. They don't get to own anything. They don't, their time is not their own. If a parent tells a child, it's time to go to bed, they have to go to bed. They don't get to decide that. Children also don't do anything. And so the kingdom comes as a gift. And for a child, children are really good at accepting gifts, at receiving gifts. Something I've noticed is that adults are not very good at accepting gifts. We always feel like we have to do something in return if someone does something for us. Or like, for example, if someone gives you a gift at Christmas, you feel like you have to give them something back, even if you weren't going to originally. Children aren't like that. Have you ever watched a child receive a gift? They don't try and refuse it or say, I can't accept something like that, or like, that's ridiculous. Children have no problems joyfully accepting the gift and promptly proceeding to play with it. Children know how to receive gifts. And the kingdom of God is a gift. It's a free gift of grace. And we don't do anything to earn it. And in order to receive it, we have to give up our rights and become um, our time, give up of our possessions. Um, yeah, and become like a child or like a slave in this instance. All right, so let's move on and let's look at this, uh, the next part of chapter 10. It's about a rich... The rich young ruler, as it's commonly um, called,
called, so we'll see what happens to him. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good, except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, I have all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? So at this time, um, wealth would have been seen as a sign of God's blessing in the Old Testament and throughout, yeah, just throughout the Old Testament, God blesses um, people who are righteous. And so at the time of Jesus, it would have been common thought to think that the wealthy were also righteous. And so the disciples were amazed that Jesus is saying it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom because they have this idea that if you are wealthy, you have been blessed by God. And so then they're like, well, who can even be saved then? If he can't, like he's done everything right. If he can't, then who can? And Jesus looks at them and says, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And I really like the message translation of this verse. No chance at all if you think you can pull it off by yourself. Every chance in the world if you let God do it. Um, it's back to the, it's not, it's not anything that you do, but it's a giving up of your rights and receiving of a gift. Um, and children are, are in becoming like a child who has no rights and it has the ability to receive a gift. Um, and God's the one who, who does it. God's the one who does the work. And then Peter, Peter pipes up and is like, we have left everything to follow you. Like, but Jesus, we have like done this. We've given up our homes and our families and everything to follow you. Like, doesn't that count for anything? Um, and Jesus responds that whoever, whoever leaves homes and brothers and sisters and family and children for him and the gospel will um, receive a hundred times as much in this present age. So he's saying that they will receive a, d a different kind of family, a new kind of family, God's family, um, but along with persecutions, along with suffering, um, and also eternal life. And his last statement ties it back into the beginning. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This all kind of wraps up it back to the, the children who are last in society, but first in the kingdom of God, and the rich man who is um, first in society, but last in the kingdom of God. So, I'm going to do a little review, and then I have a practical application if you want one. So, in review, kingdom, the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like children. Children have no rights, and they are good at receiving gifts, and so they receive the kingdom as a gift. There are two examples in this passage of hindrances to entering the kingdom like a child. The disciples who didn't have time, and the rich man who didn't have space. So, um, I have a practical spiritual exercise, if you would like, <laughs> to incorporate it into your life this week. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to say that I am not making this up. I put, I am taking this out of a book on spiritual formation by a student of Richard Foster and Dallas Willard, for those of you concerned about legitimacy. <laughs> um, but it's play. Play, play. Yeah, incorporating play into your life this week. Play is a spiritual exercise that can teach us about living in the kingdom of God. It's probably my favorite spiritual exercise because play is so much fun. Um, 
Children are free to play, but as adults, sometimes we forget how to play. And when I say play, I mean literally anything, like doing anything that excites you, or I mean it can be anything from you know gardening to making food to painting to playing sports to dancing. I mean anything that makes you excited. And children play with spoons. They play with like things that aren't even like play things. So it can yeah basically be anything. Um, but this creates a time, play creates a time and a space um, to practice your ability to receive um, gifts from God. But by definition, play involves randomness. We don't know, you just simply don't know when you're playing a game, you don't know like which way the ball's gonna go or how your friend's gonna respond in your make-believe world. Like, play can't be controlled by you um, no matter how hard you try. And so it's an exercise in learning to let go and let go of control and um, become vulnerable and open to whatever happens. It helps you practice giving up your rights. One of them, your right to control your life, um, your right to your time. A lot of times we think play is a waste of time. Well, is your time that important that you, um, yeah, is your time yours or is it God's, right? Like, is your time more important? And better, better spent elsewhere. Jesus had time for the children, and um, play is an exercise in letting go of your time. Um, play is also fun and creative, and when you take the time to create and you know do whatever, paint and dance and play with children, you can play basketball, whatever. You're enjoying a gi the gift of life God has given you. So you're also learning how to receive a gift, an undeserved free gift and using it. Um, it's a, yeah, just a way to practice receiving a gift and playing with it. Because that's what children do when they receive gifts. They play with their gifts. They use them. Um, play ultimately is an act of self-abandonment. Um, we stop taking ourselves so seriously and simply enjoy life. So. I would encourage you, I'm sure most of you are already doing this, I know I've heard um, a lot, some things a lot of you are doing, but I encourage you to take some time this week to intentionally um, incorporate play into your routine um, and schedule if you would like as a spiritual exercise. Um, yeah. The kingdom of God is here, it's right now, it's in the moment, and play helps us to remember that, helps us to remember that our rights, we don't have any rights. Our rights are not our own. And um, we have a free gift from God and we don't deserve it, but we are allowed to play um, with it. So, yeah. Anyway, I would just yeah encourage you to play this week and, and have a good week. <laughs> Don't let Satan. Don't let Satan. Don't let Satan.